Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFM LP 103.3 FM, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist, anti-authoritarian radio show broadcasting from occupied Saligi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from people, projects, and struggles around the world engaging in the long project toward liberation. You can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or at protonmail.com or send us letters at P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm is a locally owned co-op specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. This week we have a show with two parts. Firstly, I got to sit down with two members of Blue Ridge Anarchist Black Cross about the ongoing and increasingly dire situation in South Carolina prisons. I won't take up too much space here with an intro because we have a pretty packed show, but they outline some upcoming actions coordinated at the behest of people incarcerated in South Carolina, a phone zap scheduled for tomorrow, Monday the 21st, and organizing as anarchists doing prisoner solidarity work. Secondly, Bursts got the chance to connect to a couple of anarchist comrades working as combat medics engaged with the SDF in Rojava. In this interview, they speak briefly about the work they're doing, their experiences in the recent Turkish invasion into Syria. Um, Here are a few sites you can keep up with on what's been going on. Also, check out the recent interview on fellow Channel Zero Network affiliates. It's goingdown.org with CJ a Syrian anarchist in Kwamishlo, as well as the recent series by CrimeThink, also of Channel Zero Network, on the background of the Rojava revolution and anarchist approaches to it at crimethink.com. Uh, both of these interviews carry a fairly heavy content warning. Interviewees will be discussing some pretty hard topics, ranging a wide uh, span. I will be repeating this at the beginning of the uh, next um, interview with people from Rojava, so just be aware that that's going to be happening and uh, take care of yourself if that is something you need to do. But first, here are some words on behalf of a radical propaganda workshop happening in New Orleans from November 1st through November 4th. Quote, Team seeks to educate students in digital design skills, image preparation, printmaking techniques, dissemination methods, and visual strategy to sharpen our movement's ability to communicate, disrupt, and intervene in spectacle society. For four days, students will be hands-on learning screen printing, rhizograph, offset lithography, publication layout, design for print, as well as partaking in conversations and lectures to connect practical with theoretical knowledge. We will exercise, eat, and take care of the space together while producing material. Participants will leave the program with not just the printing and design skills to produce effective propaganda, but also a know-how about starting and continuing an autonomous print shop. To register, email teamworkshop at protonmail.com, and that's team spelled T-E-E-M. And for more information on this, you can go to team.noblogs.org. And now, here are some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. The President of the United States is a know-nothing asshat. His recent policy decision to pull out of northern Syria has served as a green light for Turkish military and paramilitary to exterminate the Kurds a crime against humanity for which the United States is complicit. Confronted by those critical of his decision, the President has asserted that the Kurds are, quote, no angels, unquote. This is what he says about people who were largely responsible for the defeat of the Islamic State and who still hold the keys for 11,000 Islamic State prisoners which again goes to prove that he always doubles down on his dim wittery. We are now witnesses and bystanders, not just to genocide, but to the elimination of what just may be the most successful and inspiring evolution 
of non-hierarchic direct democracy in modern history, and certainly in our lifetimes. In the mid-20th century, neo-colonial governments, mostly established by ethnic Arabs, sprang up throughout the Middle East. As European empires withdrew, they installed local elites, a kind of corrupt patronage by capitalists. These neo-colonial governments took a variety of shapes, from monarchies and military dictatorships to theocratic republics and socialist one-party states. Despite their seeming variety, all of them were connected to their prior colonizers and were essentially pitted against one another. This created a kind of complex and multi-dimensional conflict zone with lots of moving parts and ever-shifting alliances. There was, it seems, a never-ending source of hostility between these neocolonial nation-states. Throw in the natural resources, chief among them oil, and the animosity is multiplied exponentially. Besides the nation-states, you've also got non-state actors, from the PLO to al Fatah, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, Daesh, which is the Islamic State, Al-Nusra, and the Taliban and Hamas, who are non-state actors when not holding state power. In the midst of all that, you've got the Kurds. The Kurds are an ethnic minority in a number of nation-states. Roughly 30 million people, the Kurds are the largest stateless minority in the Middle East, living in the connected transborder area of southeast Turkey, northern Iraq, northwest Iran, and northern Syria. Because of the way these nation-states were eventually carved out, the Kurds constitute a marginalized minority in each of those countries. Kurds have long sought their own state, a recognized Kurdistan. To this end, the Kurdistan Workers' Party, or PKK, formed in 1974. It was Marxist-Leninist, and the PKK for decades engaged in paramilitary attacks, mostly in Turkey, from strongholds in Iraq, Iran, and Syria. Due to a vacuum of state power caused by the 1990 Gulf War, the PKK was able to form a kind of autonomous zone in northern Iraq, where Kurds enjoyed self-rule. By 2012, they controlled most, if not all, of the northern no-fly zone. The PKK and its People's Protection Units, or YPG, initially formed as an ethnic-based national liberation movement, much like the Zapatistas of southern Mexico. Also like the Zapatistas, the PKK and the YPG evolved into something much more. In Rojava, where the established nation-state power no longer reached, the Kurds began a revolution in direct democracy. In February of 1999, Abdullah Ocalan, the founder of the PKK, was arrested and imprisoned in Turkey. The PKK had already been evolving in its structure, but in 2005, Ocalan issued the Declaration of Democratic Confederalism in, in Kurdistan. This document marks the PKK's break with statism as it calls for a border-free network of confederated self-ruling regions. I think it should be noted that Ocalan's decoration was not the beginning of this democratic confederation. The declaration merely described the natural self-organization in the villages of Rojava and elsewhere that had already taken place. The Kurds had already created an autonomous and self-governing network of communities and villages. Okalan's declaration was just a conscious acknowledgement of what had already happened. It's also worth noting that the PKK's direct democracy was influenced by Murray Bookchin and other anarchists. According to its founding charter, Rojava was composed of democratic autonomous regions of Afrin, Jazira, and Kobani, regions made up of Kurds, Arabs, Chechens, Armenians, Syrians, Arameans, and Turks. It exercised direct democracy of popular assemblies. It was both non-statist and non-republican. As opposed to hierarchical government, which is both top-down and authoritarian by nature, 
Rojava's social system was both bottom-up and organic. A true democracy, where all had equal power in small localized communities that operated by consensus. In 2015, as the Islamic State was expanding throughout Iraq and Syria, the United States had already written off all of northern Syria. They anticipated the extension of the Islamic State all the way to the border of Turkey and had no military strategy whatsoever for containing it. No government troops could stop it. In fact, the U.S. had already begun discussing the situation as if Kobani, an important location geographically for its strategic value, had already fallen. The fact is, Kobani hadn't fallen. Kobani still stood. The Kurdish resistance, composed largely of women, waged guerrilla warfare against the Islamic State and not only succeeded where nation states had failed, but managed to push the Islamic State back. The Kurds had been outgunned and had been outnumbered by as many as 10 to 1, but the Kurds of Rojava were non-state anarchists, so the Islamic State didn't stand a chance. Of course, it took Islamic anarchists to defeat Islamic fascists. Since that time, nobody has been more instrumental in neutralizing and defeating the Islamic State, which is why the Kurds still hold roughly 11,000 captured Islamic State fighters. Now, in a show of appreciation, the United States, who has had the most to gain by the courageous and heroic resistance of the PKK and the YPG, has decided to pull up tent stakes, leaving the Kurds at the mercy of Turkish military and paramilitary. By cutting and running, the U.S. has given implicit permission to exterminate the Kurds, to erase Rojava from the face of the earth. I'm not saying all of this to get you to feel solidarity with the Kurds. I'm saying all this in hopes of inspiring you to do what I can't do since I'm locked up, and that's to get a passport and a go-bag together and to get on the next plane to the region so you can take up arms and defend what's left of Rojava. If I weren't locked up, I'd be on my way there now. I don't, and, and don't get it twisted. It's not because I'm brave or selfless. I'm not. Fact is, I'd rather bleed and die in Rojava than live in a f***ed up world that stands by idly and allows the best that humanity has to offer to get slaughtered. If I had a choice, I'd rather die with the Kurds than live without them. And I hope you feel the same way. If anything I just said constitutes treason or terrorism, please make the most of it. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain in Exile from Ohio at Buckingham Correctional in Dillwyn, Virginia. If you're making the U.S. pay for betraying the Kurds, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain at his latest address at Sean Swain number 2015638, Buckingham Correctional, P.O. Box 430, Dillwyn, Virginia 23936. You can find his past writings, recordings of his audio segments, and updates on his case at seanswain.org, or now follow him on Twitter at, at Swain Rocks. Here is our interview with Blue Ridge Anarchist Black Cross. Thank you all so much for agreeing to sit down. Um, Would you just introduce yourself if you care to and talk about, like, the group you're affiliated with or groups you're affiliated with? Uh, I'm with Blue Ridge Anarchist Black Cross. Uh, We're a group that does uh, some support for political prisoners, and we have some recurring events here in Asheville at Firestorm. Um, Same with me. I'm also with Blue Ridge Anarchist Black Cross in Asheville. How long has Blue Ridge Anarchist Black Cross been around? Blue Ridge Anarchist Black Cross formed after the uh, 2016 mm. nationwide prison strike. Uh, so it's been around since September 2016. So we're here to talk about um, sort of an unfolding situation in South Carolina prisons. Um, would you talk about what has been going on regarding, regarding that? Yeah, um, it's unfolding, but it's also ongoing. And that's part of the issue is that So basically we're talking about egregious conditions in South Carolina that are being fueled 
by, and this is across um, L3, which is the like high security level, uh, across L3 facilities in the state. So it's not really situated in one facility or another. It's really across L3 facilities. It's fueled by the fact that these facilities have been on and off, basically rolling lockdowns or, you know, you'll say, oh, you're on lockdown. They say, no, we're on modified lockdown. Mm. It's lockdown. Mm. Um, <laughs> for the last like two years. Um, So this is almost unprecedented level of lockdowns um, ongoing in this fashion. And that tracks back to, well actually precedes for some facilities, it precedes the the fight at Lee Correctional in 2018 that led to the death of 22 people um, or involved 22 people and and led to, to many deaths. Um, I should fact check myself there. Do you know? I believe seven people. A huge fight that went on for eight hours in a public area mm. of the of the prison that um, no staff at any time attempted to stop, um, leading to the death of seven people. So this is something that uh, kind of touched off the 2018 prison strike. Was very much framed around what happened in Lee, just as a as an emblematic example of of the way that lockdowns and and negligence on the part of staff can lead to an egregious loss of life um, and injury. So the lockdowns that kind of preceded Lee had already begun, and then once Lee happened, it just snowballed. And and then we have the situation we have now that almost two years have gone by with lockdowns and modified lockdowns across L3 facilities, which, you know, lockdown is a euphemism Mm. (laughs) um, for basically for solitary confinement. You have long-term solitary confinement, people confined to nine by 11 cells for between 20 and 24 hours a day. There have been periods of time where people went for up to two weeks without a shower. People are being brought food in their rooms, um, so they're not interacting with anyone, they're not seeing the sunlight. Certain days of the week, they only get two meals a day. And this is really being fueled, if, if the department will say, and this is true, that it's being fueled uh, oftentimes by severe critical level uh, staff shortages. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, obviously, <laughs> my personal perspective is not that we need more guards, it's that we need fewer slash no <laughs> prisoners. <laughs> but, but the reality is that staff shortages do drive the severity of this. Um, because they keep people in the cells because they can't, you know, they feel they can't let them out because there's no one running the prison, basically. Um, you have prisons with like hundreds, maybe even up, up to a thousand people that are being run by like 10, 12, 15 staff at a time. So as a result of this, um, you see things like unprecedented levels of violence of people against each other mm-hmm. in the prison. You see incidents like one person who was stabbed and and staggered, stabbed in broad daylight on the yard and allowed to just bleed out and die. Again, no no aid to this person. Oh um, so like wrongful deaths of, of various natures, also mysterious ones in which you know the prison has information that they don't release. Um, and then they decided that even letting in sunlight through the tiny window that people have in their cell, which of course, again, remember these people are locked down, so they're not going outside to wreck almost ever. They decided, oh, we're going to cover those with metal plates. So they installed these metal plates over the windows, and then people were literally not even seeing the sun. Like some people haven't seen the sun barely at all in two years. So that's a little bit of what is going on in South Carolina. That's horrifying. Yeah, and, and the response of the department to this situation has been, I mean, of course, they're the ones creating the, <laughs> creating the situation, so obviously their response is going to be inadequate and inhumane, but um, just to really show you the level of <laughs> inhumanity and negligence, um, their response is to jam cell phones. Mm. They've decided that's like the big thing. If you listen to Brian Sterling, who's the head of, um, of SCDC, his his whole thing is is that it's the contraband cell phones that are causing the violence, and so if we just jam cell phones in in the L three facilities, that'll take care of it. I think they spent about eight million dollars installing pneumatic locks and you know upping the right because that's like the security theater is that it, all these problems we just need to increase the security of the physical facility of the you know surveillance infrastructure. Um, when obviously. <clears throat> 
that's yeah. not you know that's not a perspective I agree with. And um, this is a, a a trial. It's it's been illegal for state prisons to deploy cell phone jammers. Mm-hmm. Only the, the federal government can deploy cell phone jammers. So Brian Sterling has been campaigning for years to get cell phone jammers deployed and got permission to do like a trial at South Carolina prisons. So they're kind of in a test run now. And if they deem this test to be successful in South Carolina, we could see cell phone jammers being deployed all over the country. And cell phones is like one of the few ways that we actually get to see footage and, you know, Mm -hmm. what's going on inside of prisons and see the abuses documented. And um, also it allows people to communicate with their families and stuff. Um, But this, it could be really dangerous if um, these get deployed. It makes me think of um, some recent hunger strikes on the part of Palestinian prisoners against cell phone jammers specifically as there's like thoughts among prisoners there and also like studies to back this up that cell phone jammers can have like really negative health effects oh, wow. in the short term. I don't know if it's the same kind of cell phone jammer that is being used in Palestinian prisons as would be used here, but like people report having like really, really, really bad headaches in the short term and in the long term, certain kinds of cancer. Wow, um, I did not know that. Thank you. For yeah, of course. That. I mean, that just made me think about it. Um, I'm wondering about if y'all have a little bit more of a perspective on the staff shortages about like why they are happening or whatever. Um, do you have any words about that? I could definitely guess. I've seen <clears throat> there's a perspective that says, oh, you know, the pay has to be higher. Mm. Right. So it's I think probably starting salary is between like thirty and thirty-five thousand dollars a year or something for for a guard in in South Carolina, um, which actually is kind of higher than I would have necessarily guessed. But um, it is, you know, it's difficult and dangerous work. Um, you know, it sucks. Like, who wants to be in a prison every day? Um, it's not something that people. I think grow up thinking when I'm <laughs> when I grow up I want to be a prison guard. Uh-huh. Um, so and and I'm sure it is depressing and I'm sure it is probably scary. You're like constantly immersed in that security theater, even if you're part of it, like mm-hmm. you're in it. And uh, sometimes there are incidences of guards being killed or or injured. Like it definitely has happened. Part of the reason for the lockdowns in in South Carolina do have to do with incidents of. Um, I mean, it happened in in North Carolina at Pascatank, right? That a guard was killed. So, you know, it does happen from time to time, so I imagine that's part of it. There's also a lot of corruption on the part of the guards, so guards are often um, getting, you know, incarcerated themselves for having snuck contraband cell phones into the prison, and contraband of all kinds. So the, the often the, the people who are, end up in the prison sometimes are related to the guards or mm. know them, and then there's, like, relationships that start, and then that can lead to... You know, it just, it's really high turnover. It's a high turnover, crappy entry level job. And these are the people who are supposed to like oversee the, you know, quote unquote care of other human beings. So I think that that's like maybe some of the logistics or background factors. And then there's just like, I don't know. I think it does something to your brain. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And my asking about that is not so much to, like, give voice to the plight of the CEO because I'm definitely not interested in that because they can choose to be there. I don't care what people say. Like, I'm from a prison town. Like, there's other jobs out there. You can work in the gas station. You can work wherever. Um, But maybe to, like, connect it back to the people who are not choosing to be there. Um, I Before the interview, we were talking about some connections to like North Carolina prisons um, that this situation has. Um, Would y'all talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, and I think we've talked about this a little bit on the show before, that there's one prison in particular in North Carolina, um, which is in Salisbury, um, Piedmont, CI, where um, they've been now, by the time this airs, pretty much they'll have been locked down for, um, again, modified lockdown. 
for uh, six months. So not as long as what we're seeing in South Carolina, but it's obviously going that direction. Um, and that is a specific supposedly outgrowth of the uh, fight that occurred there where a, a number of people were stabbed. And, you know, it's having the same effects. They also, North Carolina also chronic staff shortages. Like mm-hmm. this, is, this is just something that's happening in DOCs across the, the country because of the size of the system, right? Like we know that the size of the United States criminal justice system is just so vast that it's going to have every other thing that we talk about with criminal justice, the conditions, the costs, the reentry, like every, the violence, everything about it in so many ways like flows from the size of it, right? Because you just have this monster. And so, you know, it's important to, I think later we'll probably talk about our visit to South Carolina Mm -hmm. um, yesterday in a little bit, but um, the reason that we've become very aware of and are coordinating actions around South Carolina right now is because we've received urgent calls for help from inside that we're trying to be responsive to. Mm -hmm. But while that's happening and while our focus is there, we're also receiving urgent calls from help in North Carolina mm-hmm. constantly. So that's one thing. They, there was just a hunger strike in Scotland CI that was actually pretty successful. Similar issues, you know, yard time. They were being, it, it was a lot about yard time because really these lockdowns are, are just solitary confinement. And so obviously there are people are who are like officially assigned to solitary confinement which is horrible yeah. enough but now with these lockdowns you have essentially general population also being consigned to solitary confinement on and on and because they have never been like officially sanctioned for anything you know theoretically when you go to the hole for administrative segregation it's like you know, you did something wrong or whatever, mm. and, and then you have a certain stint that you're supposed to do and they're like monitoring it. But when you're on lockdown, you didn't do anything to precipitate it, so it could just end never, mm-hmm. which is a really messed up state of mind to be in. So that was what was also happening at Scotland and certain people have experienced the, 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 the hunger strike itself was fairly successful. Some grievances were uh, addressed in, in minor ways, but the people who led that strike or who were uh, pointed to as leaders have been retaliated against very, very, very badly, especially Joseph Stewart, um, who was a politicized prisoner. So definitely shout out to Joseph Stewart, and we highly recommend people like support that person. So that's, yeah, that's kind of what's going on in North Carolina. It's going on everywhere. <laughs> it's going, mm-hmm. and whoever's listening to this, whatever state you're in, it's going on there. Prisoner suicides have doubled in South Carolina between 2017 and 2018. I think that bears mentioning. Um, That's another manifestation of the hopelessness Mm -hmm. uh, when people really don't see their condition as, as, you know, when they see it as bad and not potentially getting better. I don't think that we can call that a manifestation of mental illness. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, obviously there are, mental illness is prevalent within incarcerated populations, but I don't think that when we see something like the doubling of a suicide rate in a prison system that's been locked down for the last two years, that is somehow, oh, everyone spontaneously became more mentally ill. No, you're engaging in torture. People are going to mm-hmm. have consequences from that, you know, and want that that situation to end. So those are the kind of things we're seeing and those are the kind of things we're going to see in North Carolina as well when mm-hmm. when this is the situation mental illness is <clears throat> weaponized to explain away a lot of like violences that are done under like capitalist white supremacist patriarchy so yeah yeah that's well said so you you talked about your the would it make more sense to talk about like the actions first and then I would love to hear about like the visit that y'all had about had in in a South Carolina facility and like the thought behind the thinking behind it and Yeah, they're connected. Um, so, yeah, do you want to talk about the visit? Yeah. Um so we visited a couple prisons in South Carolina yesterday. Um we went to McCormick and Perry. And we were just trying to talk to people as they were leaving their visitation hours. We didn't want to uh, go at the beginning of visitation and cause any kind of disruption to mm-hmm. visitation because the you know if the prison decided like oh there's a security threat they might cancel visitation on people. 
and we heard that at Perry, actually, they recently just, I think yes, uh, Friday, actually, they canceled visitation. Um, but yeah, so we went at the end of visitation and talked to people who were coming back, explained, you know, what was going on and the the call to action and and just tried to, like, give them our contact information so that if they have any stories they want to share with us or want to work with us more, um, we can stay in contact. I really like that. Um, so prison just operates on <laughs> isolating people and isolating people that are connected with it. So I really like that y'all were trying to sort of flip that around. This is the Final Straw Radio, and I'm your host, William. We're listening to two members of Blue Ridge Anarchist Black Cross talk about conditions in South Carolina prisons and ways that you can get involved if you so choose to. Yeah, and and it was pouring rain the entire time. (laughs) So we didn't really get to get into like conversations with people as much because everyone's just like fiddling with their umbrella and just like trying to, you know, get in their car. But so we didn't really get to have too much back and forth, especially because, you know, we don't know these people, you know, they we're not going to ask them to like pour their heart out to us standing right there in the parking lot, especially after they've just been through an emotional experience with a loved one, you know, leaving visitation. But notably, you know, of the dozen or so people we talked to, everyone was receptive. Like no one was like, no, I don't want that piece of paper you're handing me. You know, mm-hmm. I don't want to hear about that. Oh, you guys are just you know, meddling or you don't understand. But no, everyone accepted the information, said thank you. You know, I think people were maybe a little confused because as you were saying, it's like the social isolation. Um, So people are not used to being approached in a sympathetic way, I think, when they have incarcerated loved ones. And they're especially, I think, not approached very often in a way that's like sympathetic and also constructive. And like, we want to, you know, we want to do something. Mm -hmm. We want to advocate. We want to work with you and we want to hear from you. So it was like not a ton of interaction, but it was very n- n- observable that people were glad that we were reaching out and, mm-hmm. and, and certainly not resenting. I think I know something that might prevent people from organizing like at prisons or with incarcerated people's loved ones, they might have a a concern that like, oh, my presence is going to be resented or people are just going to think I'm some like activist. And like, sure, there might people who be people who have that response and that's totally uh, fine if they feel that way. But I wouldn't let that stop you because actually people are like, wow, that's great. Someone actually cares about mm. the person that I care about who's in here um, and, and doesn't want to just shame me, you know, wants to actually be there for me. And, and there were people who responded with stories about um, what what they're, like just little snippets of information about, like, like the thing about canceling visitation. Mm-hmm. Um, and there have been other groups on the ground um, that have actually one of the people we ran into yesterday, I didn't talk to them personally, but one of the other people in our crew talked to someone who said, oh yeah, we were actually just at a demo here at Perry the other week because there had, and we had known uh, as we were planning our visit that there was a group of people who do have incarcerated loved ones who did stage a little demo at Perry. Um, theirs was more of like a demo, less of like, they had like signs and things like that. And we had actually talked to one of the people from that group and invited them to be participatory. They couldn't make it, but um, you know, it just shows that I think there's a growing network of people who, who wanna be on the ground and provide support, whether they're coming from you know, a political position on prisons or whether they're experiencing it daily with loved ones. Um, it, there's a lot of different reasons to get involved in this work. There's Free South Carolina Movement, mm-hmm. which, you know, you can look them up. They, they're a politicized group, more similar to our kind of politics of, of being more more radical or like abolitionist minded. I'm not sure if they're officially abolitionist, but... Um, you know, just really calling attention on the ground. And is is that related to the Free Alabama movement? I, I, I don't know that they're necessarily affiliated, but I do think that coming out of the prison strike, a lot of, I couldn't speak to it because I don't mm. know for sure, but the name is very similar. And I think they did emerge out of the same set of conditions um, yeah. you know, and prison slavery movement connected with the prison strikes. And it really has, it's been building like over the last four years since the 2016 strike and then 2018, it's really been building. And and so, so this visit that we did, it was um, in response to, to wanting to make connections with people, 
provide people with with the understanding that there's someone out there who they can um, you know reach out to, to to contact for advocacy but also it was planned in the way it was on the day it was because specifically this is connected to a larger action that's going to be happening this coming week mm. so as I mentioned earlier there have been urgent uh, calls for help coming out of South Carolina and One of the specific asks that was made of outside supporters was to make contact with the United Nations Human Rights Council. Um, If you pay attention to anything about the American Mm. criminal justice system, or if you've been listening to the rest of this interview, (laughs) you've probably figured out by now that, you know, DOCs in the United States cannot, cannot be trusted for any reason to, you know, to self-monitor, hold Mm -hmm. themselves accountable. There's, you know, they're the ones creating the conditions. So why would they (laughs) hold themselves accountable for it? Like it just strains any kind of (laughs) reasonable thought. So um, I think there's an understanding of that amongst people inside. And as things get worse and worse and show no sign of stopping, there's this, you know, there's a, a panic of like, well, who can we, who can we reach out to? Who can help us? Um, so I think there's an idea among some people that maybe if we take this to the international stage, um, at least for witnessing, mm-hmm. if not for action, um, it would be great if, if you know, international human rights observers could come to South Carolina, could come to all prisons. <laughs> and I think as an anarchist personally, you know, I have critiques of rights-based discourses. I have critiques of, you know, obviously, I have critiques of government, so I have critiques of institutions of international governance, like the UN. But that being said, I think there is value, Mm -hmm. like a ton of value to making note of the fact that like there is so little legitimacy to any any um, appeal to justice within within the United States. I mean, we've even seen entire state departments of correction that have been put under DOJ review, essentially like taken out of the hands of, I think Louisiana Mm -hmm. um, was, (laughs) the the federal government was like, whoa, y'all are like really bad. Mm -hmm. We're going to just take that over. But like nothing's changed in Louisiana, you know? So I think it's, it, it is, there is value to calling, shaming, you know, shaming the United States on the world stage. It, it, it should happen. It needs to happen. People do not understand what's going on here. They do not think that human rights violations happen in the United States because it's like, oh, beacon of democracy or whatever. Human rights violations are just so endemic mm-hmm. to the prison system here. It's just, it, it would really like blow people's minds. So I think, um, you know, responsive both to the specific ask of people on the in the system, and also you know, kind of in line with our with our own politics, we've decided to help coordinate a delivery of a letter to the UN to UN offices across actually the world. Mm-hmm. We've got four cities in three countries um, coming up: New York City, London, Kingston, Jamaica and Washington DC and then there are a few others in potentially other in other countries but they're not like locked in yet so I don't want to misspeak but yeah I mean at least four cities across three countries will be delivering a statement with basically just everything we've been talking about Mm -hmm. um really just you know summarizing the situation that's going on in South Carolina and a number of prisoner demands not for the UN so much as like to drama you know to to illustrate what they're asking for and what they need and then asking really the ask from the UN is to dispatch human rights observers or a special rapporteur Mm -hmm. to South Carolina to be on the ground and to document and to witness and to tell people what's going on here so that's going to be happening all over the world this coming week that's (laughs) awesome if listeners are like sparked by that and want to like be a part of delivering the letter or um want to be a part of like some other actions that are going on this week. How can they find more information about that? Um, I think FTP is probably the best organization to reach out to. So our part here with Blue JBC, because we're not anywhere close to UN and UN office, we were like, well, we're close to South Carolina, so mm-hmm. we can go to South Carolina and tell family members that this is happening. So that was kind of like our part. And then um, other organizations that we're kind of in coalition with, like IWOC and FTP, are helping to uh, actually organize these demos. So I think um, contacting 
yeah, contacting IWOC or FTP is a great way of cool. um, like checking their social media. There's a press. This is not a, obviously I'm talking about. It. It's not a secret of action. There's a press release going out. Mm-hmm. So these are this is definitely something that we want you know as many people to show up. If you're in London, if you're in DC, if you're in New York City. Um, you know, I think the American ones are probably going to be larger because mm-hmm. um, we have more contacts there. But yeah, I mean, hey, if you're in another country and you're, you know, not doing anything on Monday, <laughs> get, get some comrades together. Um, we'll have the we can make the the statement available to you and you can you can deliver it there. So there are some other like call more call in campaign. What are these and like what how can people plug into that if they're interested? There's um on uh, Monday, which is tomorrow, October 21st, uh, you can call the director of the South Carolina Department of Corrections, Brian Sterling, and uh, let him know about the action. Uh, you can let Brian Sterling know that his department is not only a national embarrassment, but an international one as well. <laughs> and there's also a hashtag that you can follow on social media. It's hashtag sunlight is a human right. Should we say the phone number for Sterling? Oh, the right. Example? The phone number is Eight zero three eight nine six eight five five five. And while we like, you know, while you can definitely, when you call, you can express, you know, support for for people and for ending the lockdowns. Um, you can express support for the for the people's demands, which are four quick demands, which we can we can read briefly. But I think because this is all about pointing out the fact that now we've essentially had to go over the head of not just the South Carolina Department of Corrections, but also just like the entire country. Like mm-hmm. we've we've been pushed to have to reach out to the international community. I think it's like less uh, you're calling to demand something and more like calling to make fun of him basically mm-hmm. <laughs> and just be like, wow, yeah. <laughs> you're famous, Brian. <laughs> Internationally, <laughs> people know. What a piece of trash you are. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I just want you to know, have a great day. <laughs> you know? Which I think is can be a more, for people who do a lot of phone zaps, this can mm-hmm. be like a more fun one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I could read the demands? Yeah, yeah, do the demands. Okay. Um, <clears throat> these are the list of the uh, demands from South Carolina prisoners. One, we demand academic and vocational programs to help prisoners learn a trade and or certificate to help prisoners transition back into society and give them something productive to do while in prison. Two, we demand SCDC provide general population prisoners outside recreation seven days a week, Monday through Sunday, and stop using shortages of staff as a justification to deny general population prisoners outside recreation. Three, We demand SCDC remove all steel coverings off of all windows prohibiting sunlight from entering through the cell windows. And four, we demand SCDC provide an adequate dietary meal that meets the daily caloric intake of at least 2,200 calories, especially on Saturday and Sunday when prisoners are only given two meals a day, i.e. breakfast and dinner. Prisoners are not given lunch on Saturdays and Sundays. That is a low bar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is a really low bar, and that should really like call home yet again the you know egregiousness of this situation. I think that is all the. Well, those are all the questions that I have. Unless you want to talk about like how folks can help support this situation in other ways. Are there ways? Are there are there are other ABCs in the area that they can reach out to or like ways that they can get involved in a more long-term way? Um, I don't know if there are others in the area. Um, If if people are, you know, in in Asheville and they would like to get involved, um, they can, you know, show up to any of our events on the Firestorm calendar. We host screenings of Submedia's Trouble documentary series the um, first Friday of every month at six o'clock at Firestorm. We also have a letter writing night where we write birthday cards to political and politicized prisoners. Um, That's the first Sunday of every month at Firestorm at 5.30, I believe. Um, Five. Five, (laughs) sorry, check the calendar, (laughs) maybe for the best times. Um, But, you know, also if you're you're not in the area or, or if, this kind of organizing is not your thing. 
there are all over the country. There are other ABC chapters. There are also books to prisoners chapters that are great ways to plug in mm-hmm. and you know get connected to people who are incarcerated and, and provide them with books and read letters. Um, and I walk also incarcerated workers organizing committee. Um, cool. Just see what's in your area. Yeah, and just also be a voice for like humanizing incarcerated people like in your workplace amongst your friend group if people make jokes or say well they did something wrong you know push push back um Mm -hmm. if you can and you know note that that our system engages in human rights violations Mm -hmm. um, if you feel comfortable using that language because it it does speak to the severity of what people are, are suffering and Another thing that people can do is is participate in phone zaps. I think sometimes it's easy to just be like, oh, I'm not going to make the call or like it doesn't do anything. But that's actually not true. Like phone zaps are actually fairly effective. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they don't necessarily like create change. You know, they don't revolutionize the system, but um, they, they actually can get certain demands met on the part of prisoners and um, they do like word filters in to the prisons that, you know, a lot of people have called and that lets them know that people are supporting. Um, And the other thing is if you, you know, if you do have a crew already, but maybe you're not actively doing like prisoner support, like think about starting to to do that Um, because, you know, it's really easy to just start corresponding with people and um, getting, getting plugged in. And, you know, we went, this this visit that we made was with six people like it doesn't this is not like you have to organize a big demo and make a bunch of signs like it can be low key it can be very uh just close comrades you know just get a carload of folks Mm. um you know be safe about it if you think that you might you know run into any kind of repression you know maybe have have someone ready to do some kind of jail support for you or something but um, it does not have to be an elaborate plan. I think that definitely that has stopped me in the past from organizing things because it just feels like, oh, it's going to be a whole thing. Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't need to be that much. You do it in one day. You go, you talk to people, you know, hand them something that has your email address and say, get at us if you want a hand advocating for your loved ones and just leave it at that. Like mm-hmm. it does not need to be a really built up thing. It can just be reaching out and then that provides the next step and the next step and the next step. That's awesome. Thank you all so much for sitting down with me uh, at such short notice um, and for talking about this situation. Uh, Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. That was our interview with two members of Blue Ridge ABC. Again, Brian Sterling, the head of South Carolina Department of Corrections, can again be reached tomorrow at 803-869-8555. A full list of demands and a loose script for this phone zap can be found at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. To support Joseph Stewart, who BRABC shouted out in the interview, you can write Joseph Stewart, number 0802041-22385 McGirt's Bridge Road, Laurenburg, North Carolina, 28352. Here now is Burst's interview with two anarchist comrades doing defense in Rojava in northern Syria. I'll repeat our content warning from the beginning of the show. The two people talk about some pretty hard topics um, as they are in an active war zone. So just be aware that these topics are going to be discussed and um, act accordingly in whatever way uh, works best for you. Would you please introduce yourselves, however you will, for the audience, like names, affiliation, and political views? Hi. To briefly introduce uh, myself, my name is Gulan. I'm an anarchist from uh, the so-called United States. I'm operating here in northeastern Syria, or uh, Rojava, in the capacity of a combat medic uh, under the general umbrella of the SDF, for the Syrian Democratic Forces. Uh, we organize with a collective of other combat medics and attempt to administer uh, direct care to people 
in combat or uh, directly outside of it, whether that be civilians or military, and uh, like render critical care in the time where there's uh, the biggest window for uh, death or otherwise. Um, yeah, Gulan pretty much said it all. Um, I'd like to remain nameless, but I'm also an anarchist here um, in Rojava, um, operating as a combat medic. Many anarchists and radicals, Syrians, Kurds, and others around the world have been gripped by the terrors introduced by the Turkish state in the last week and a half. Can you talk for anyone living under a rock about the geopolitical shifts that have happened and their consequences? So to speak to the more uh, recent past this region um, and what's happened in the past few weeks, I think I would first uh, suggest that people listen to other interviews that have been done on the final straw about uh, Rojava and the project in northeastern Syria um, for more of a background and context. But of course, as people familiar uh, even a small or beginning level about what's happening, um, Generally speaking, the Kurdish people, along with other uh, ethnic groups, especially uh, the Armenians and the Syrians, have been facing persecution from the Turkish state uh, for decades and decades, and uh, have been facing increasing pressure from the Turkish state in recent years as uh, Erdogan eyes the autonomous administration that's been established in northern eastern, northern eastern Syria as a threat to um, what he sees as the integrity of, of the Turkish state. Um, he claims that this region is being used as a space from which to attack the Turkish state, but actually if we look at the facts, uh, we can see that that has not been occurring, and in fact in this year alone, according to the Rojava Information Center, we've documented around 30 cross-border attacks from Turkey uh, into this region. Recently, uh, Erdogan decided uh, that he wants a safe zone to uh, claim what uh, to, to shield Turkey from what he calls a corridor of terror, and that's in the part of the region uh, that borders Turkey. He claims is being used as an area from which to launch cross-border attacks from this region into Turkey, which, uh, as I already mentioned, is not happening. He pushed the United States under threat of invasion to implement a so-called safe zone, and the United States and Turkey have been effectively haggling over what this distance would be. Erdogan, the whole time, has been insisting on a 30-kilometer safe zone extending along the entire border, which for anyone familiar with um, the makeup of this region actually includes the vast majority of the population here and most of the large cities, actually almost all the biggest ones. Uh, so, of course, this 30-kilometer proposal was rejected by North and Eastern Syria and the Autonomous Administration. Um, and a smaller zone was agreed upon to put off an invasion threat in uh, July and August. This area was around 5 kilometers, up to 9 kilometers in some. And Erdogan, the whole time, was saying that this was not enough, that he would continue pushing for more. The United States kept stalling. And every time there was uh, an attempt to somehow like, kick the can down the road to avoid a uh, full Turkish invasion, all the while Turkey would launch cross-border attacks of artillery, rockets, um, of a very like, infrequent and sporadic nature, but it always looked as though they were attempting to provoke the forces on the side of the border to react. About two weeks ago, uh, well, perhaps three weeks at this point, the United States uh, decided to pull their forces off the border. This uh, announcement came from Donald Trump in an early morning announcement following a phone call he had with uh, Erdogan of Turkey. Um, and Donald Trump decided to pull his troops off of the garrison, specifically at Serkania, and, as he said, um, pave the way for Turkey to act, as he called, called it unilaterally, since Trump has said he did not give the green light for Turkey to invade, but by saying that he recognized that Turkey wished to act unilaterally and then pulling troops off the border, he in fact did green light the invasion. Following the troops pulling off the border, which was truly uh, the only thing standing in the way of Turkey launching a full-scale invasion, Turkey did just that, and October, on October the 7th, um, Turkey began engaging along the border uh, in every town, whether that be Kirisbi or Serkinia or Kamishlo, uh, by beginning with artillery and airstrikes, and then eventually uh, in certain areas, specifically in the area around Kirisbi and Serkinia, uh, with ground troops from uh, Turkish proxy forces um, and in a few areas, uh, the Turkish army. Since then, um, 
there has been locked a uh, life and death struggle along the border as these cities are struggled over and Syrian democratic forces attempt to defend these areas from Turkish invasion um, with varying degrees of success, but in all cases, uh, really inspiring stories of resistance. Um, currently, there is a so-called ceasefire. Uh, Erdogan has actually called it a pause in the fighting rather than a ceasefire. Uh, the ceasefire was announced uh, without agreement from actually the SDF initially. It was between the Americans and the Turks. And they are attempting to negotiate perhaps better conditions of a safe zone and an end to what can be termed, uh, in our view, an ethnic cleansing attempt by the Turkish army and their prox proxy forces across the border. Currently, this uh, so-called ceasefire only affects uh, Turkey's ability to launch airstrikes and artillery strikes. Uh, their proxy forces are still quite active, are still moving and acquiring territory, and are still engaging in firefights with the Syrian Democratic Forces. Um, over the last week or two weeks, um, we have been um, traveling back and forth um, from Serkanye to Taltamer, mostly in Serkanye. Um, there's a hospital there, Roche Hospital, that has been um, surrounded at various points, attacked almost every day um, while trying to provide medical care for a lot of um, injured people. So um, over the last week, we have seen um, Sarah Kanye increasingly filled with Cheta, um, Turkish proxy forces, um, and seen it become more and more difficult to get to the wounded and get the wounded to us. Um, there was some time where the the road in and out of Serikanya was um, taken at several points by Cheta. And so we could no longer transport people to higher care facilities um, and we couldn't get, you know, more doctors in, more nurses in, or patients out. And so um, some people fell shaheed waiting for the ability to leave the city while the powers that be were taking their time to come to some kind of agreement about this no-fly zone. Um, you know, we're getting airstriked, airstruck almost every day. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the situation over the past week. Is there anything that you would add? Yeah, um, that's like all a uh, accurate and really thorough recap of, of what's happening. Um, I think to add to that, what we've been most surprised about is a think somehow our worst dreams coming true, and that uh, being the dreams of like a resurgence of Daesh or ISIS. Um, the tactics that we've like, witnessed, uh, Cheta, which uh, is what locals here refer to the Turkish proxy forces as, um, we've witnessed them using a a style of tactic that is like very reminiscent of Daesh um, in terms of executing civilians, uh, executing uh, military personnel. And in many cases, people are being arrested or taken as prisoners, prisoners of war and then being outright executed. Um, civilians and members of civic organizations are being stopped on the road and pulled out of their vehicle and executed. Um, <clears throat> starting on the first day of the invasion, uh, some of the first actual attacks we heard of were uh, Cheta dressing up as uh, Yepik soldiers in uniforms, infiltrating uh, checkpoints and carrying out attacks that way. Um, and of course, the night that the invasion started, there was a very large scale Daesh attack in Raqqa where about 50 Daesh militants were storming checkpoints and uh, doing suicide vehicle attacks. So this all certainly feels coordinated somehow, even though there's uh, no direct evidence of that. There have been wounded patients that came into Serkania Hospital that claimed they were fighting Daesh uh, and, and quite heavily insisted on that as, as a fact. And again, to point people to the Rojava Information Center, they've uh, compiled a list of people with the Turkish Free Syrian Army or the Turkish proxy forces that are former uh, Daesh militants. So the link is, is actually um, quite prominent. I think it just in regards of what we've experienced, other than uh, directly being on the front line and trying to administer medical care in uh, the best way that we're able to, um, it's, it's rather unnerving to see the news and how people 
um, back in the U.S. are talking about this Daesh resurgence when we're somehow, uh, it is a possibility when we're actively seeing it. And uh, this invasion almost has the feel of being Daesh plus airstrikes and artillery, which is uh, very unnerving and is, um, I think, quite the thing to consider. What's happened to you in the last week? What sorts of incidents can you talk about? And how have you experienced the Turkish invasion, Daesh repri- reprisals, and popular resistance? As to um, popular resistance, um, because realizing that a lot of this is really uh, dark and, and bleak, and it feels like there's not a lot of hope, I think for myself, I am somehow like gaining m- more of a hope and faith in humanity after seeing the popular resistance, especially in Syracuse. What What we're seeing is... Um, a multi-generational, multi-ethnic, um, like pluralist resistance to fascist aggression um, in every sense of that. It, we're seeing everyone from, you know, what you would, I suppose, traditionally see as like a hardened fighter of the SDF next to just normal citizens of Syracuse who have somehow not decided to, but have had to take up arms to defend the place where they live from this fascist invasion, fighting alongside each other and giving each other the same amount of like respect and love that they uh, would expect. And it's, it's really inspiring and, and lovely to see, um, despite like the hard circumstances. For many people, uh, the morale remains high and, and the hope um, and the defense still stays high. Uh, and the morale gives me an increasing amount of hope in the situation, uh, even when things seem really dark. I think one of the most inspiring things to me has been how many fighters will come in from the front lines and will be treated for, for injuries, and the whole time that they're being treated will be begging to go back to the front lines. Uh, and I think we can all remember people coming back um, for treatment multiple times and going back out, sustaining multiple injuries. And um, that's because of their belief in each other, their, their belief in this project here, um, their belief in their comrades and their deep love for each other. Um, but most of all, of course, that they do not have a choice in what they're doing, that um, this was a situation they've been thrust into and are like handling it with, I think, like a really inspiring um, commitment. And it's like really beautiful to see. And... Uh, Yeah, you phrase it as popular resistance, and I think that's probably the best way to characterize what is occurring here. Yeah, I I don't want to get too off topic, but something that's really struck me over the past few days in particular as things get rougher and rougher is like um, the importance of Hevalti among comrades, this concept of a really deep camaraderie and friendship that has made it possible for me and for other people to do things that we never thought were possible. Like when somebody next to you is able to like keep up their feelings of like love and struggle to some of the extent that we've seen friends here um resist like it really it it makes it possible for everyone around to to do more than we could possibly imagine and i think it's it's also like there there have been people who like even in the darkest times are able to like put on a good face and and really like not pretend to be happy but also find joy in even some of the darkest moments together and find like bravery um together and i think um yeah like the most like normal average people who are living their lives in saracania who are from saracania who never wanted to be fighters like have stepped up um to defend their city and so if there's anything that we can learn from this all over the world is that like anyone can be a part of the defense of um, of a movement from fascism, can be part of the defense of their city, can be part of the fight against Turkey. Um, and so if there's anyone who is like listening to this or who's looking at these stories of people, like I, I would encourage everyone to find within themselves the things that we share with these people, like the very human, um, the very human spirit that allows us to resist. Um, so, yeah, but I think... Also, I want to echo what Havel Gulan was saying. Like, this is a really multi-generational, like multi-ethnic, multi-gendered resistance. Like, there are women of all ages involved in this. There are men of all ages involved in this. There are Arabic friends. There are Kurdish friends. There are people from, like, many countries around the world. And, like, we, like, work together seamlessly. We love each other, like, seamlessly. And I really mean that, that, like, anyone here 
um, involved in this struggle is like really loved and held as a true comrade by people here without question. And I think that's something that has really affected me and impacted me is seeing that kind of that kind of unity in struggle. Yeah. This is the Final Straw Radio Show broadcasting first on 103.3 FM in Asheville, North Carolina. I'm your host, William. You're hearing two anarchist combat medics in Rojava talking about their organizing, what it's been like for them there so far, and um, keeping us updated on the situation. So Turkey, under Erdogan's AKP, has been paid by the EU to hold and warehouse humans, refugees from the Syrians' war and other destabilized places in West Asia and Africa, to slow their entry into the Schengen zone of Europe. They announced the plans to repatriate Syrian refugees from within their borders into the so-called buffer zone that Turkey's been pushing for in northeast Syria along the Turkish border after removing Kurdish populations and others. Can you talk about this? Yeah, I mean, we've seen over the generations um, Kurdish areas being ethnically cleansed in many ways. Um, And I think, like it's very clear that Erdogan's interest in this has to do with like the strength of Kurdish communities. If there is a way to destabilize and ethnically cleanse these areas along the border, it will also destabilize Rojava and prevent this project from continuing to grow or even to exist. And I think that we can see like these more, um, I guess like democratic ways of organizing, um, these stateless ways of organizing in the kinds of, like bottom up ways of organizing are a direct threat to fascism and are a, like the complete and total opposite of how like Turkey is run by Erdogan and i think that being so close to a project that is like so like such a threat to to fascism like of course he has an interest in destabilizing this by ethnically cleansing the area and that's what this is is like these are not this is not about returning people to a place that they are from this is about ethnically cleansing and an area along the border because it's convenient and it helps to reinforce Erdogan's power. Um, so I know these like conversations are complicated because there are like refugees and they need a place to return to, but this is not like, this is not that. I don't know what else to say. Do you have anything to add? Yeah. Um, I, I think it gets complicated because especially before the Syrian civil war, but in particularly after it, in particular after it, um, there are accusations of ethnic cleansing somehow thrown around by every sect and every side in this conflict. And that's an accusation that gets levied at uh, the Ipiga quite a bit by um, its detractors saying that they've ethnically cleansed the area of like, the Arabic population and this sort of thing. And I think to push back on that quite a bit, because that's uh, somehow not actually what's what's happened or what this region looks like. If you actually spend time in this region, uh, the fact that it is like a pluralist society becomes very um, frank and very apparent to you. It's it's not as though culture ways or life ways have been doing anything other than continuing to exist except uh, under somehow the protection of, of the SDF from Daesh or Daesh resurgence, or in this case, Turkish aggression. So it's not a case of pushing the Kurds out so that the people that the Kurds allegedly drove out can come back, that uh, those people were never driven out. There, of course, are limited instances along the border where people were affected by the Daesh propaganda that there was such a thing happening at the hands of the Yipige and they fled. Um, but those people largely came back. Uh, Syracuse is like one of these cities where we actually see like really strong examples of this, um, where there was like a fear that somehow it was only going to be like a Kurdish population uh, were proved wrong, and, and now like the idea of a pluralist society was able to flourish, in particular uh, in some of these cities along the border, which is really inspiring. I think you know the proposal to resettle refugees is is a good one, uh, but they need to be where they were originally displaced from. I think that's a, a really simple idea. What's happening is Erdogan is, is really um, using the situation to justify his hatred of um, the ethnic minorities in northeastern Syria. Uh, 
he's using the refugee crisis as sort of a Trojan horse to sneak in his plan of ethnic population, sorry, is his plan of ethnic cleansing on these populations and use one as an excuse for the other. And it's, I, I think it's really transparent what he's attempting to do. Um, and if he has his way, it's, it's going to create another refugee crisis. It's, um, if you look at it just from that perspective, it's uh, like robbing Peter to pay Paul, as, as the saying goes, you end one refugee crisis and you create another one, which is already being created. There's already hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, people from north northeastern Syria that have already been displaced and more will come if this uh, war of fascist aggression continues. News reports have spoken about a ceasefire lasting 120 hours agreed to between Ankara and Washington, though Turkey refuses to engage the terms of the ceasefire in terms of the YPG and YPJ aligned forces. What is the situation with the Turkish aggression, Syrian National Army, and Russian military engagement, and forces at least formally known as SDF? Is shelling still happening? Well, um, say what you will about uh, Turkey and Erdogan, but at least for the first time, and it seems like ages, they're actually being honest about their intentions. Um, Washington may have some designs on this being a ceasefire, but no one on the ground has any illusions of this. Um, from where we are in Syrkania, um, I, I, I do not believe that shelling or airstrikes have taken place under the ceasefire, um, but Jetta and um, the Turkish proxy forces in the area have very much been using the time uh, to advance, to consolidate their lines, to um, continue engaging um, on like a, a infantry level with small arms, uh, indirect and direct fire, you know, heavy weapons and rockets and, and that sort of thing. And um, I think as anyone who's been under fire can tell you, it, it doesn't really make, make too much of a difference if you're being shot at with a mortar or an RPG. Um, both certainly are... Uh, uh, having the ability to kill and destroy. Um, so in, in that way, uh, I believe Erdogan called it like a temporary pause to the fight. <laughs> Even this is perhaps not accurate. Um, in regards to the, the Russian forces and the SAA, I believe this is impacting them in maybe more of a concrete way, but these forces were not really engaged along the uh, front that we're a part of to begin with. Um, they seem to be in action more along the, the Membej front and that sort of a thing. Um, it's kind of hard to see what Erdogan expects to, to gain out of this other than the hope that the SDF will like vacate their positions along the border and I think talks are ongoing about um, what, what will come of this. But I think the problem with, with uh, any idea of a ceasefire and the ultimate naivete of it is that once these Turkish proxy forces have been uh, sort of let off the chain and are allowed to run wild in northeastern Syria, the, at least from where we sit, it doesn't actually seem like Turkey has that much control over their actions and what they do. So any kind of a ceasefire, or, or even if there's a decision to end the war, I think would be like limited. I think this, um, you know, devil is out of the bag and fighting would probably continue as long as these forces are in the region. What's come of Daesh detention facilities? Has there been an uptick in attacks on religious minorities? Have many prison breaks occurred? Sleeper cells may be awakened in the chaos? Hey, um, we don't have like direct experience with the, um, the Daesh detention facilities and things that are going on there, so it's hard to speak to that. We've also been kind of out of the loop with the news for the past however many days. Um, so maybe someone else could speak to that. But we'll move on to the next question. What sorts of troop losses have been experienced by, by the YPJ and local self-defense groups by the combined, at the hands of the combined Turkish, Daesh, and FSA assaults? So to speak to the losses of the um, defense forces here, it's difficult to give a specific number. We've heard um, hundreds of Shahids. Um, we're seeing a lot of really severe injuries. So I think something that we will see is like people dying in the longer term also from their injuries. Um, but yeah, I think the losses in some areas have been really heavy even just in the first few days. Is there anything you want to add? Yeah, uh, last night on the news I heard a Shahid count of over 200. Um, 
And it's really hard to remark on like what what feels accurate or inaccurate because uh, again, as uh, the friend mentioned, we've been kind of out of the loop with news and missing a broader perspective somehow uh, while we've uh, been at the front. Um, but for me, this number seems rather low. And the reason why I say that is because hospitals I know that are off the line have shaheed counts of over 50, for instance, of people that have died in their care. And we've heard multiple stories throughout the time we've been there of uh, Tabor's um, losing you know, over 20 people in one attack or in a series of bombardments or airstrikes. Um, if, if I put together the numbers that friends have told me on an individual basis, like coming to our hospital and saying, uh, I'm one of only three left in, in this unit or in like n numbers that I've like personally like seen, this number seems really low. I think because communications are really difficult right now, this number is, is going to, uh, increase dramatically throughout the days of, um, the ceasefire. And um, it's also important to realize when we consider like the inhumanity of these airstrikes that a lot of the time um, they're, they're in fact is like not a way to actually um, like observe someone anymore if um, you understand what I'm saying. Um, it's not to be like gruesome and, and graphic, but to understand like the inhumanity uh, of, of these airstrikes and, and what's actually occurring and the amount of like missing people is I think something that is going to cause uh, the death toll to rise. Um, quite dramatically and the the number of killed i think is quite high in proportion to wounded and that proportion looks different than i think it does for other fighting forces and other wars again because of the use of drones and um air power because people are, are suffering injuries as the friend said earlier that like do not have to result in in death but because some comrades will be wounded for instance and then can't move for the next six eight ten however many hours out of fear of drones um they're having to stay and essentially hope that their friends do not uh die during the time that they're not able to move um so the the situation with like loss of life is, is uh very severe but people do find a way to carry on i think that what Haval gulan is alluding to is that it's difficult to have a count on the number of people who fall in Shahid because sometimes when there's an airstrike, nobody is left behind. Um, and also, uh, sometimes with the counts that um, we're able to get numbers for, um, it doesn't include civilians. It's really difficult to figure out how many people um, have been affected. Uh, but <laughs> these numbers, I think, will come out as time goes on. Yeah, 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 yeah.